What is going on, Headliner Nation? Jake, Fantasy Headliners. Hopefully you guys are all doing well out there. Welcome back to the Draft.com studios where today... Talking about them ball catchers here in Week 7 Fantasy Football. The wide receiver position starts and sits. We've got a lot of big names on bye week this week. I mean, we have the combination of DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel, Odell Beckham, Jarvis Landry, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Juju. Not a lot of people missing Juju right now anyway, but those are some you know must-starts every single week that we are not going to have here in week seven. So we're going to be a little bit creative at times. There's a few names that you may thought that you would never start in fantasy football, but you may end up doing it this week. However, before we get into that, we're always transparent here. How do we do in week six for the wide receiver position? Let's dive into the numbers. All right, so for week six, we had a total of 50 wide receivers that we gave a start or sit designation to that finished their games here this week. Out of those 50, we got 33 of them correct for an accuracy percentage of 66%. Some of our biggest hits had Stephon Diggs as a start last week, and he scored like 40 points. Big game for Stephon Diggs. Terry McLaurin, somebody who I had really high up in my rankings, had himself a great game. Curtis Samuel, solid day for Carolina. Calvin Ridley produced another another decent game for his owners there. Some of the misses, though, Golden Tape, saved by a 60-plus yard touchdown, and he bobbled into the end zone. That's going to happen. Robbie Anderson wasn't doing anything until he busted like a 90-yard touchdown. Big fantasy day there. Alshon Jeffrey did a little bit better against Xavier Rose than I had expected. And Mike Evans should have had a huge fantasy day. I had him as a sit. He still finished his wide receiver 13, but did break into those double-digit fantasy points and half-point PPR scoring. So he was a miss also. However, overall, a very solid week once again here for the wide receiver position. But now let's dive into week seven. Let's see what we have coming up and who should we be starting and sitting. All right, Thursday night football, Chiefs and Broncos here up first. And for the Kansas City Chiefs, automatic start Tyreek Hill. Back from injury, looked great in week six. Back to his normal fantasy producing self with a few touchdowns. But after Tyreek Hill, it gets a little bit dicey. Miko Hardman, Demarcus Robinson, Sammy Watkins, who's already been ruled out he's not going to play, and Byron Pringle, who I didn't include on the graphic, but he's somebody who else's name we could add under the sit column. Why am I sitting everybody else? They're very boomer bust. Last week, all these guys only saw four targets apiece. Miko Hardman had the best game out of all of them, and all he had was four catches for 45 yards, and that's in a game where they kind of had to abandon the run and rely on throwing the football. I expect a lot more Tyreek Hill, a lot more Travis Kelsey going forward, and maybe even some more usage with LaShawn McCoy and Damian Williams out of the backfield. So the only guy I'm starting for the Kansas City Chiefs this week is going to be Tyreek Hill here for the wide receiver position. Now, Denver does give up you know, only 17.7 fantasy points per game. I know a lot of people look at the Broncos and say, ah, they're not very good. It's a great matchup. But they are fairly good against the pass. However, Tyree kills upside, not something you can sit. For the Denver Broncos, though, the only person I'm going to bother starting is going to be Cortland Sutton. He's been super safe as of late. He has six straight weeks now with seven targets and is number one in the NFL among wide receivers in red zone receptions with seven. Right now, Emmanuel Sanders banged up with a knee issue. Even if he does play, the last thing that you want is for him to go into the game, realize he can't go or re-aggravate something. And the next thing you know, you've started a guy who's getting zero points in your starting lineup. Not going to take the risk with Emmanuel Sanders here this week. Kansas City does give up over 20 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. So it's a safe floor, a great play here for Cortland Sutton once again in week seven. All right, here we go. Sunday football. Got the Dolphins and the Bills going head-to-head this week. And I actually have somebody in the comment section here earlier in the week tell me that they're sick of hearing me rag on the Miami Dolphins. Can I stop? The answer to that is, how about no? I'm going to rag on them because they suck. And they are I don't care if they're tanking or what the reason is behind it. I'm telling people to start the players against the Miami Dolphins for a reason. It's because they score points, and this week should be no different. I was really looking forward to starting John Brown in a few of my leagues here this week. Great matchup. Then, all of a sudden, after practice, kind of popped up on the injury report with a groin muscle. Something to pay attention to. Does it limit him? Does it take him out of the game this week? That's something to pay attention to. Cole Beasley, another one of these safer options, especially in PPR leagues. He has uh, double-digit targets here, two out of the last three games, and he could see even more if John Brown misses. Now, a lot of people want to get in the comment section or, or on social media and ask about Duke Williams. 
Do they want to start Duke Williams? And I don't want to overreact to Duke Williams. Let's see him get a little bit more volume here and see what he does with it before we just automatically assume the guy is the second coming of a wide receiver one here in Buffalo. Give him some time. Let's see what happens. Don't make rash decisions here midseason of your fantasy football league. So Miami does give up over 27 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. So make sure you're paying attention to both Beasley and Brown. If they're good to go, I want them in my lineup. Now, also, another big factor in this, why I'm so high on these guys, the top defensive back for the Miami Dolphins, Xavier Howard, didn't even play last week, and who knows if he even plays this week. There's a chance that he misses once again. He's been banged up. Just another reason to get these guys in your lineup if they're healthy. But now, let's talk about the Miami Dolphins just for a second. It won't take long. The biggest news, Fitzmagic is back. He's back under center. No more Josh Rosen. Back to Fitzmagic. All he does is throw touchdowns and throw interceptions. Nothing in between. The guy is very, very, you know, erratic. I mean, he could go out there and throw for 400 yards and then come out the next week and look like he's never played quarterback in his life. Which week are we going to see from Fitzmagic? Do we really want to trust any of the weapons here for the Miami Dolphins? I mean, you have fantasy Bigfoot, who's been seeing six targets a game while Ryan Fitzpatrick was under center to start the season. I, I do like Albert Wilson's upside, but going against a Buffalo Bills defense, which is pretty stout to begin with, they limited Tom Brady and the New England Patriots a few weeks back. I don't expect the Miami Dolphins to be better than the New England Patriots. In my opinion, these guys, neither one of them are safe enough to start this week if I had to. Like, if I had no other choice where I had to start one, deep league, flex play, no other options, I'd go with Fantasy Bigfoot and hope for a sighting and go with Devontae Parker. Outside of that, I don't have that warm fuzzy for anybody in Miami. Jags and Bengals up next, and the one name that everybody wants to talk about when we're talking about the Jacksonville Jaguars is DJ Chark, hashtag Chark Week. Now, if I sit him, people get pissed. If I start him, I have the opportunity to get pissed at myself. I mean, you see the matchup on paper, going up against the lowly Cincinnati Bengals, and you think it's a great matchup, but actually... Cincinnati's pass defense isn't horrible. They only allow 17.4 fantasy points per game, which is fourth best in the NFL. And I've talked about DJ Chark a lot in the past. Yes, the volume, the targets are there. Not all of them are catchable, so keep that in mind. And he's highly touchdown dependent. If he does not score that touchdown, he doesn't get enough receptions on a weekly basis to really give you that safe floor. His floor is literally like two or three points. Can that is that something you really want to take a gamble on in week seven? I understand the upside with DJ Chark. The kid is very talented. You know, two years ago when he came out into the NFL draft, I had a chance to see him at the combine, and I was more than impressed with the skill set. I like Gardner Menchu under center. Not as easy of a matchup as a lot of people may think, but he is still somebody that if you need a flex play here this week, I don't mind DJ Chark as a flex. Just don't go into this. I've had people tell me, hey, this guy should be a top 15 guy in your rankings. He's too up and down for that. He's not incons- He's too inconsistent for me to put him that high. The upside is definitely there, and that kind of warrants a weekly flex play, at least a flex consideration on a weekly basis. D.D. Westbrook doesn't really have that touchdown upside, may see the volume. So unless you're in a full-point PPR league, not really overly interested in D.D. Westbrook on a weekly basis. Now, for Cincinnati, this needs to be the reemergence game of one Tyler Boyd. Uh, quit messing around, and he needs to actually go out there and produce some big numbers. Right now, Jacksonville's D, we know they're without Jalen Ramsey. No longer there. He's a part of the Los Angeles Rams. Jacksonville gives up, on average, 22.7 fantasy points per game. A.J. Green still not back in practicing yet. Cincinnati throws the ball 44 times a game. Why? Because they can't run the ball because their offensive line is so horrible. Auden Tate kind of has emerged as a weekly flex option. His volume is starting to increase, and we already know he's that big-bodied wide receiver that has that red zone upside. Last week, he had 12 targets, 5 catches, 91 yards. If you're in a deeper league looking for a flex play, Auden Tate is not a bad option either. Vikings and Lions up next, and as much as I know that I probably should not do this, I'm going to. I'm starting both Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs once again. Now, no, I'm not expecting another 40-point game from Stephon Diggs, 
but I do see the upside here in this matchup. Right now, the Lions are allowing 21 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs, but most importantly, I really expect Dalvin Cook to get going on the ground in this game. He should have a lot of opportunity there. If that's the case, defenders drawn into the box, more one-on-one coverage on the outside. That's where we see those big plays happen from Thielen and Diggs. Right now, Adam Thielen currently fifth in fantasy points per target, which means for every target that he's getting, he's scoring 2.6 fantasy points. He's also top 10 in red zone receptions. Right now, Stephon Diggs. He's currently third in fantasy points per target. Now, a lot of that is somewhat skewed from those big plays last week, but what that tells you is that when you get the ball to Stephon Diggs, he can make things happen. It's not that he was struggling early on here in the season. It's that he wasn't getting the volume to produce the big numbers consistently. If the volume is there, Stephon Diggs is going to put up some big numbers right now, sixth in the NFL among wide receivers with 11 deep targets right now here in the first half of the season. But for Detroit, really the only piece that I'm interested in here is going to be Kenny Galladay at this point. He's top 10 in deep targets red zone receptions, and he's never had less than eight targets in a game here so far in 2019. Detroit could have to throw a lot if the run game cannot get going here against the stout Minnesota Vikings run defense. Jones, Marvin Jones, he's more big play dependent, needs that big play touchdown to really give you that high upside, and so far, he hasn't really had it happen. He's only averaging right around four receptions a game, and he's not scoring the touchdowns like he has in years past. Passing on Marvin Jones starting Kenny Galladay. Raiders Packers up next, and they must be handing out free drinks in the medical tent because everybody's headed there right now for both of these teams. I mean, right now we have Tyrell Williams of the Oakland Raiders still not participating in practice with the foot injury. Green Bay does allow 21.7 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers, but who are they going to throw it to that you actually trust on a weekly basis? Do you trust Trevor Davis? Do you trust Hunter Renfro? How about newly acquired Zay Jones? Now, before I go any further, Zay Jones, that's a name you need to remember. I think big things could happen here in the coming weeks for Zay Jones. However, I want to see how Carr uses him. How much does he look his way? If he's heavily involved in this offense, and this is a lingering issue for Tyrell Williams, Zay Jones is somebody who has some sneaky upside, especially in some deeper leagues. If you are in a deeper league and you're looking for a bench wide receiver that has that upside, Zay Jones is a name that I would just think about taking a flyer on because the upside in an offense that needs wide receivers could be there in the near future for one Zay Jones. But let's see if Carr actually looks his way. Like I said first, that's kind of the most important thing. I don't want to throw him out there in his first game as a Raider and just expect big things. Let's see how he's used. But the same really goes for the Green Bay Packers at this point. Devontae Adams, does he play? Probably not. I mean, he's still questionable. It hasn't really been ruled out yet, but do we see him this week? That's a question mark. Geronimo Allison, concussion protocol. MVS, he's dealing with knee and ankle injuries. I mean, what's going on here in Green Bay? A lot of people want to know about Alan Lazard. Is that somebody who we can count on? Well, a lot of that really depends on the health of these players. If Adams, Allison, and MVS, they can't go or they're severely limited, then yes, all of a sudden, Alan Lazard has some huge upside. If they can go, then no, Alan Lazard is kind of useless. It really depends on the health. So this is something we need to pay attention to because why? You want to start some wide receivers here for the Green Bay Packers this week because the Oakland Raiders, a lot easier to throw on than run on right now, giving up 27.8 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers, the fifth most in the NFL. Let's just see who's healthy here heading into the weekend. Rams and Falcons up next. I'm going to stretch the limits of the start column here in this one because I like everybody in this game. Right now, the Atlanta Falcons give up 29.4 fantasy points to opposing wide receivers. That's the second most in the NFL. Right now, the Falcons are kind of like that team that you want to play against to kind of get your offense back on track. Who needs to get their offense back on track? It's the Los Angeles Rams who may be once again, possibly without Todd Gurley. If that's the case, expect a heavy dose in the passing game because they should be able to move the ball pretty easily going up against the Atlanta Falcons. So Cup, Woods, and Cooks, their ceilings are very, very high this week. Right now, Brandon Cooks may be the highest risk. He's a little bit more big play dependent. Doesn't see the volume that Robert Woods and and Cooper Cup see consistently on a weekly basis. But, I mean, these are guys that you definitely want to have in your lineup here this week. On the Falcons' side, 
Obviously, you're starting Julio Jones. We don't know if Jalen Ramsey is going to suit up yet for the Los Angeles Rams or not. If he does, I imagine he's going one-on-one with Julio Jones majority of the game. But there's a chance that Jalen Ramsey does not even play, or if he does, it's in a limited basis. There's no more Marcus Peters. He's in Baltimore. Akib Tlaib, he's gone, he's hurt, he's injured, he's not playing. This could be a heyday also on the other side for the Atlanta Falcons. Right now, Los Angeles gives up over 20 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. So Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, and even Mohamed Sanu as a flex play are all options here for me in Week 7. Texans and Colts up next, and we're still being patient with one DeAndre Hopkins. Yes, the big games, they're not there, but at least in half-point PPR leagues and higher, he's still scoring you right around double-digit fantasy points per week, which is a bonus. You can't say that for a lot of the big names does as of right now. He is still currently fifth in the NFL in targets and reception, so the volume is still there. He's just missing the touchdowns and those big plays, those big chunks of yards that we're used to seeing in the past from DeAndre Hopkins. They just haven't been there, but right now the Colts allowing on average over 23 fantasy points per game, and you have to keep DeAndre Hopkins in your lineup. Will Fuller, a little bit more of a boom or bust play on a weekly basis. However, the volume has started to creep up for Will Fuller. He has 31 targets in the last three weeks week. So as a flex play this week in a game in which Deshaun Watson is going to be throwing the ball once again, and he's playing absolutely great. I don't mind that flex value for Will Fuller. Now on the Colts side of the things, the bye week did them a lot of good. They were a little bit banged up before the bye week. T.Y. Hilton included. Now looks to be back to close to full health. Going up against the Houston Texans is an absolutely great, great matchup for one T.Y. Hilton. What makes it even better is Their top corner, Bradley Roby, will not be playing in this game. He could miss up to a month. Houston was already giving up almost 27 fantasy points a week to opposing wide receivers. This only makes things easier. T.Y. Hilton, in my opinion, the only wide receiver that I would touch for the Colts as of right now. But he's he's an automatic must start for me here in Week 7. Niners and Redskins up next. And not going to lie, not too many pieces in this game that I really, really like. Now, for the 49ers side of the ball... It's just because they don't throw the ball enough. Right now, on average, they only throw 30 times per game. Second fewest number in the NFL. And when you look at the wide receivers they have, none of these guys are really running away with the target share. If you look at these names, Marquise Goodwin, the most uh, targets he's seen in a week, four. Debo Samuel, the most he's seen, seven, which was way back in week two. And then Dante Pettis, his highest total of the year, was six, and that was last week. None of these guys are getting enough volume on a weekly basis to be a safe fantasy start at this point. The offense is still good, but it's going through that running game, and George Kittle, not so much the wide receiver. So I'm going to pass on all the wide receivers here for the San Francisco 49ers. On the Redskins side of the ball, I still like Terry McLaurin. One of the main reasons I like him is because Case Keenum is still under center. Now, this is a difficult matchup going up against one of the best defenses. The 49ers only allow 19.7 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. But right now, Terry McLaurin hasn't seen less than seven targets in a game. He's also ninth in the NFL in fantasy points per target with 2.47. Big play upside is there on a weekly basis. And all Case Keenum does to Terry McLaurin is throw touchdowns. They've had touchdowns in every single game they've played together. Love Terry McLaurin once again. Does he have that crazy huge upside that maybe we saw last week? No. But as a, as a flex play or better with wide receiver two upside at least in a week that you're missing a lot of studs on by, I'll start Terry McLaurin here this week. Giants and Cardinals up next, and the Cardinals getting some big help on the defensive side of the football back. All-pro defensive back Patrick Peterson will rejoin the team here this week after his six-game suspension. And there's already talks that Sterling Shepard is going to be doubtful to play here this week. So that leaves Golden Tate, who's going to have the main attention of Patrick Peterson this week. Is Patrick Peterson rusty? Is he good to go? Do they move Tate around, put him in the slot, put him on the outside, trying to avoid Patrick Peterson? That is entirely possible, but Golden Tate is still very big play dependent. Don't forget, just because we missed on him last week doesn't mean that this guy is a weekly must start. It took a 60-plus yard bobbled catch touchdown to make his fantasy day relevant. If it wasn't for that, nobody's talking about Golden Tate last week and maybe not even this week. Now, Arizona does give up, on average, 23.3 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. However... That's this season so far without Patrick Peterson. This is a great matchup, though, for the wide receivers of the Arizona Cardinals. Larry Fitzgerald, 
been a decent play, a safe play lately. Hasn't really come out there with that high ceiling game here in the last few weeks. But this is a great, great matchup. Kyler Murray, he's starting to feel more comfortable under center, starting to throw the ball more and more effectively throughout the entire game. They're going to have to continue to throw also. It's a very up-tempo offense, and the offensive line isn't great enough to really, really establish that run game and commit to it on a game-by-game basis. Right now, the Giants giving them almost 30 fantasy points a game to opposing wide receivers. The biggest question mark here is Christian Kirk. Now, uh, Cliff Kingsbury has come out and already said, hey, if Christian Kirk is 100%, he's going to play. If he's anything less than 100%, he's not going to play. Pay attention to practice reports. If Christian Kirk is going to play, it means he's 100% healthy and he needs to be in your lineup in one of these plus matchups. This is a guy who was averaging close to double-digit targets before he got hurt. Kyler Murray looks his way and he will once again this week in a great matchup We just have to make sure he's out there on the field to begin with. Chargers and Titans up next, and what the F's going on with Keenan Allen? I mean, this guy was one of the best wide receivers in football the first three weeks of the season and has basically disappeared. He hasn't seen more than six targets in a game since week three. Over the last three weeks, he only has a combined 99 receiving yards. The F's going on with Keenan Allen. I mean, they need to get him more involved. This offense sputtered last week, and they really need to make a conscious effort to get Keenan Allen the ball going forward. Now, Tennessee is no pushover. They only allow 19.2 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers, and now Mike Williams is actually getting a slight bump in that volume. He's seen double-digit targets each of the last two weeks. Now, that's not an issue. They throw the ball enough And it seems like Melvin Gordon's kind of sputtering here out the gate. It may take him a few weeks to get going and to really start producing in that run game. They're going to have to throw the ball. They're going to have to throw the ball a lot. And for that reason, I'm going to still start Keenan Allen and Mike Williams here this week. Now, on the Tennessee side of things, I'm a little bit more excited. I'm trending towards excited because they've gone to Ryan Tannehill. And if you're out there thinking, why the heck do we care about Ryan Tannehill? He can throw the ball a lot better than Marcus Mariota. Different style of quarterback, but can really you know, utilize that passing game maybe a little bit more for the Titans and really turn Corey Davis and, and A.J. Brown into viable fantasy options here in the coming weeks. However, let's see how this thing progresses. Let's see him start a full game under center. Let's see who his favorite target is. Heck, it may be Adam Humphreys that sees the bulk of the volume. It's just something we need to pay attention to. I don't want to start them here this week till we can get a better understanding of this offense going forward, but these are two names that may have some sneaky value here second half of the season. Saints and Bears up next, and despite the tough matchup, yes, you're still starting Michael Thomas. He has yet to score less than 13 fantasy points in a game this season, and he's an automatic must-start on a weekly basis. Nobody else in this offense really sees enough targets to make a difference on a weekly basis. So for the Chicago Bears side of things, there's a chance that Mitch Trubisky comes back this week, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It kind of, you know, remains to be seen. However, it does make Allen Robinson viable here again heading into week seven. He hasn't had less than seven targets in the game so far this season. He's the clear cut number one in this offense, and the Saints can be thrown on a lot easier than they can be run on right now. New Orleans is allowing 25.5 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. Anthony Miller is waiting in the wings. The guy needs to get healthy. If he can get healthy, this is definitely a name that can make an impact second half of the year. Just not quite yet. Let's see him get a little bit more involved. We saw it a little bit before the bye week. If he can build off that momentum, that's a name that you can hear a lot about here second half of the season. Ravens and Seahawks up next, and we may be heading into another week with no Marquise Hollywood Brown. If that's the case... I'm not really buying any of the other wide receivers for the Baltimore Ravens. They just don't see enough volume. If Brown sits, they kind of just distribute it more to the running game and to the tight ends. So Boykin Sneed, not somebody who's on my radar here for Week 7. And it is a difficult matchup going up against the Seattle Seahawks. But on the Seattle Seahawks side of things, I'm still going to start Tyler Lockett. Now, Tyler Lockett's kind of got the same thing that Keenan Allen has going on. I don't know if it's contagious, what's going on in the West Coast, because right now, Tyler Lockett hasn't seen more than five targets since week three. However, the touchdown upside is still there. Will Disley was lost to injury. Does that open up more targets in this passing game? For the likes of Tyler Lockett, heck, 
Maybe even, you know, DK Metcalf sees a slight bump in volume. I have him as a flex play here this week. Now, Marcus Peters on his way to Baltimore. That's going to help that secondary because they've given up on average 23.3 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. Tyler Lockett, still one of those names you're going to start on a weekly basis. I think the bump in target volume kind of makes DK Metcalf a sneaky play this week. Got him as a flex play. But outside of that, the Jerron Browns, the David Moores, not buying into it. They're very touchdown dependent. They don't see enough volume on a weekly basis to really make them fantasy viable, especially here in week seven. Eagles and Cowboys up next, and all you Amari Cooper owners out there, cross your fingers and hope that he plays. Now, they're only calling it a thigh bruise as of right now, but pay attention to practice reports because if he plays, you want him in your lineup for sure. Why? The Philadelphia Eagles secondary allows more fantasy points to opposing wide receivers than any other team in football at 33 points per game. So that also means that the likes of Michael Gallup is somebody else who I want to start this week on my fantasy rosters. Now, if Amari Cooper can't go, yes, that bumps the potential upside of Michael Gallup up. But maybe the likes of a Tavon Austin kind of come into play. He kind of saw a bump in targets last week when Amari Cooper went out. Now, do I want to rush to the waiver wire or add Tavon Austin in my season-long leagues? No, probably not. But if you're in a deep league, maybe a DFS stash, possibly if Cooper is out, that's where you kind of look at Tavon Austin. Now, on the other side of the football, the Philadelphia Eagles. It's a little bit more difficult for them in this matchup, but there is a chance that Deshaun Jackson comes back and plays this week, and they do. They need him. Right now, Alshon Jeffrey is kind of out there by himself, but that's great because he's seen the volume. Over the past three weeks, he has 29 targets. In Dallas, they only allow 19.3 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. There could be some limited upside here, but they may have to rely on the passing game a little bit in this game if Dallas can continue to score points all four quarters. If that's the case, a little bit safer floor for Alshon Jeffrey, and if Deshaun Jackson can get him some full practices here throughout the week, is another one of those guys that has that big playability on any given Sunday. Monday Night Football, Patriots and Jets, and this is a rematch of just a few weeks ago, and we're obviously going to start Julian Edelman, right? I mean, just a couple weeks ago, he had those seven catches, 62 yards and a touchdown. He's had back-to-back 100-yard games. He's almost a lock for weekly double-digit targets. Not going to spend a whole lot of time on Julian Edelman. If you have him, you're starting him. But after that, that's where it gets a little bit clouded. Josh Gordon, sounds like he dodged a major injury there in the game last week, but does he play this week? That's kind of doubtful. It's something we need to pay attention to here throughout the week to see how quickly he can recover. You know, they they talked about Nikhil Harry coming back. He's back with the team and practicing, but he can't suit up and play in the game until week nine. So that kind of opens the door for one Jacoby Myers, who's a name that continually pops up here for the New England Patriots. A lot of people don't know a whole lot about Jacoby Myers. They also re-signed Ben Watson here. But Jacoby Myers may be somebody who has some flex value here this week. If Josh Gordon does not play right now, the Jets give up on average 22 and a half fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. So Myers has that flex upside here for week seven. Now, New England on the other side, one of the best defenses in all of football. They're only allowing 14.8 fantasy points per game to opposing wide receivers. But I'm going to be a little bit bold and I'm still going to start Jamison Crowder. Why am I doing that? Well, the only wide receivers to have some success against this secondary in New England came while they were running out of the slot, Golden Tate and Cole Beasley. That's where Jameson Crowder is going to spend the majority of his time. Saw nine targets last week. He's a little bit safer than Robbie Anderson. If it wasn't for that huge 90-plus yard touchdown last week, we're not talking about Robbie Anderson. He had a very you know forgettable Sunday last week if it wasn't for that big play. Now, yes, that big play has that opportunity every single week, but it's not something that I want to go into a week counting on or absolutely needing to have happen because if it doesn't you could definitely lose your fantasy matchup so for right now Jamison Crowder in my opinion a flex start especially in PPR leagues he's the safer of the two options there for the New York Jets all right so those are my starts and sits for the wide receiver position here week seven fantasy football let me know down below in the comment section what you think 
We probably don't agree on everybody, and that's okay. If we always agreed, this show would be boring for you to watch. If nothing else, we're just supplying perspective to help you make those decisions on Sundays. That's what this show is all about. Greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget, we're giving away $1,000. The link to the video is in the description. And if you're looking for more DFS content, we do that over on Patreon. A lot of rules here on YouTube where we can't really you know, post a lot of the things that we want to due to the sports gambling side of things. So if that's what you're looking for, We do a lot of DFS content, but it's on our Patreon page. Link in the description. Just make sure you sign up for the DFS tier, and you'll have all kinds of information at your fingertips. We're winning money on a weekly basis over there and having fun doing it. So hopefully you guys have a great rest of your week. Good luck this weekend. We'll talk to you later.